Welcome viewers. We are going to talk about semiotics of legal language. You must have heard of this term semiotics several times, but I am not supposed to take anything for granted. So, I will define semiotics very briefly and then also talk about what I have in mind by legal language, especially its scope. Semiotics is an approach to any subject. It is study of S, I, G and S signs. It is also said science of signs. When we look at anything in terms of semiotics, it can be a cultural uh, system, it can be food habits, it can be language, it can be the way we organize production of a book, the way we conduct elections, anything can be semiotically discussed, semiotically treated. Semiotics is generally talked in terms of three aspects or three branches of semiotics. One is syntactics, which refers to the organization of the entities or signs. Semantics, what they mean, the significance of the signs. Pragmatics, the value of these signs with reference to the user of the sign and with reference to other systems. That is, we locate a given system into a general pattern of systems and show the relationship. That is what, that is what we do in pragmatics. So, syntactics, semantics, pragmatics, these three things constitute what is called semiotics. Now, we come to language. Language, all of us know, is a system of communication and we generally refer to what human beings use as language, though someone may extend its use to talk about the language of the birds, the language of the animals, but generally it is not done. It is generally done with reference to what human beings do. Because the human communication system, which we call language, is very different from other communication systems. I will not take too much, I will not spend too much of time on that. I will only refer to two things. It is only human language, which is known to have two patterns. One is the use of sounds. The other is the use of words in a structure. One is called phonological structure, the other is called grammatical structure. Some people call this double articulation, some people call it duality of patterning. You may, different people may use different terms. Main point is things like B U T but, T U B tub. T a b tub, b a t but. Three sounds organized differently will give you two different words. This is phonological organization. And the grammatical organization is John called Mary, Mary called John. Three words organized differently, but two different sentences. I have given it deliberately, very simple examples from English because we are not here to talk about the general patterns of language. Then legal language, the very fact we use the word legal language means legal language, scientific language, language of poetry, language of mathematics they obviously tend to be different from the way we use language in day to day communication. Otherwise, we will not use the word legal language, we just see language. 
we do not say language used in the morning, language used in the afternoon, language used in the evening. Day to day language, if you want to say social language, I have no objection, and language of a particular subject. Actually, recently I have come across an interesting expression the word incident in a common parlance, incident, an incident took place. But in physics, when the light is incident on the surface, that incident is different, that meaning is different. So, we say there is a technical sense in the field of physics. If you look up uh, Webster's dictionary, malfeasant, defeasibility, indefeasibility, they will write L A W law. That means, these words are used in legal parlance. That is why every area of use of language develops its own technical terms. Same thing when people are angry, they say it has its own jargon, but let us be respectful to different subjects. They develop their own technical terms, they have their own needs of even using grammar. I will give you examples, especially when it comes to legal language. For example, you are referring to uh, uh, an experiment in the lab and the teacher explaining it to the students. Most of the sentences he uses may be in imperative mood, take a beaker of water, put it on the flame and then he may use simple present, the water boils, the water becomes vapor. So, the it does not mean these things are not used in common man's language, but in common man's language imperative sentences and simple present uh, tense usage may not be as much as in the language used for the lab. So, that kind of thing we call it a registral study, register of law register of science, register of mathematics, register of theatre. Now, language, there is a technical term, I do not mind using it because it means something. Language is a semogenic system. Semogenic means, semo means meaning, genic means creating, it creates meanings. Generally, we are told it carries meanings, it conveys meanings, that is a generalized sense. But if you are very clear, if you are very particular about being exact, language does not convey, does not carry, but creates, it creates meanings. Earlier also, somewhere I talked about it. The typical example I give wherever I go is catch and hold, catch when an object is in motion, hold when it is not in motion. Every language will not make this kind of distinction. If it does not make this kind of distinction, something like pakanna in Hindi, pattukunu in Telugu, what is it saying? Is it carrying catch? Is it carrying the meaning of hold or is it carrying both? That means, it creates its own meaning. Here creation does not mean it is creating from some clay, that is not the idea. The idea is each expression creates the meaning for the user. We have said language is a semogenic system, that is a system which creates meanings. When we study meanings from a scientific point of view for the purpose of explaining it to people, we call it semantics. And any legal document can very safely be said is an exercise in applied semantics, because when we read a document, we understand the document. We explain the document to others and others understand. So, ultimately it is encoding the meanings and the decoding the meanings. 
So, legal documents are not like an artistic picture or uh, uh, a poem which is enjoyed for its sound system only or for its the sound effect only. Legal document is to be understood for its meaning, for the way things are understood, for the way things are organized, for the way things are meant to be. That is why I also use a term language is also a vehicle for social engineering. So, what is this? That comes from the definition law is social engineering. Law establishes relationships among human beings in a given society and that is why it is called social engineering and language is primarily used for that purpose. There is absolutely no chance of using law for any given purpose without language. A painting you use colors, a document uses language. Language of course means words, phrases, clauses and sentences. That is where language and law become very closely related. But what happens actually is what we generally use in our social discourse will not be clearly understood when we are referring to legal document. I will start with a simple example child. If in a particular act, if a minor is referred to as a child, that minor or child may refer to someone up to an age of 16 or 18 depending upon the act. Whereas, for you and me in a social discourse, child is not someone who is more than uh, 8 or 9 or 10. So, the word child cannot be interpreted in law exactly the same way which we use it in social discourse. This is what is uh, to be understood when we talk about the use of language in law. Law is our guiding force. Again, we use language. So, that is how language becomes so important. And when we say language becomes so important, again, the way we use words in law, the way you, we use sentences in law, the way we use grammar in law, I mean legal documents, all this will be important when we talk about legal language. Language, as we have already seen, it has its word structure sentence structure, meanings and values, the way meanings are understood in a given context. Ordinary language is allowed to be ambiguous. Ambiguity is having more than one meaning. That kind of ambiguity is possible in day to day language. That will not be allowed in a document dealing with physics, in a document dealing with dowry prohibition, in a document dealing with crime. Then, I mean if that ambiguity is allowed, the judge cannot come to a conclusion. The advocates will use them in different meanings. That is why sometimes some words are replaced, because that word is not carrying correct meaning, exact meaning. Uh, you may say, sir, how is it possible after all words do uh, have different meanings. That is exactly why in legal documents, technical terms have definitional meanings. As I just mentioned child, they will define a child who is a minor, who is only, who is not yet an adult. Adult means 18 plus, someone below 18 is a child you cannot question it. You say, you cannot say, sir, in the dictionary child does not mean this. We know that, but this document clearly defines what is child, what is dowry, what is marriage, what is dowry prohibition. That is where definitional values become important in technical language.
ordinary language because of this ambiguity also allows fuzziness. I mean, you are not too sure whether this means that or that means that. Ambiguity is meaning more than one. Fuzziness is a kind of confused state. I do not really know. I do not know whether it be really means that or not. That is not possible in scientific language or legal language. Because again, these are defined. Once defined, you cannot say uh, this particular word does not any longer mean this here. No. When this act was passed in 1872, that was the meaning we have to stick to it. Unless the act is amended to use the word with that meaning, now a new word with that meaning or to change the very meaning. Dowry, if someone says includes gifts, later there is an amendment, dowry does not include gifts, it means only cash. So, what is this sir? You are writing new dictionary? No, we are giving new technical meaning to the word dowry. That is where exactly uh, the definitional meanings become important for these technical subjects. A redundancy, a common language, the way we use ordinary language, redundancy is possible. We go on, uh, you say several kinds of things, but there in legal language, scientific language, that kind of redundancy will not be common because, ah, you may say, no, sir, there also to reinforce something, a word may be repeated, that is on a different footing. And that fuzziness and ambiguity sometimes leads to confusion, which again will not be allowed in the case of any technical language. These are uh, main important points. These points become very important later when we talk about something called plain language movement with reference to legal documents. Th that we will come to uh, in the course of discussion. Ordinary language use does not demand a certain willing suspension of casualness. Ordinary language allows you to be a bit casual. Technical language does not. For example, when they talk about death, they say death is finally to be certified only when the brain is dead, not when the heart stops beating. That kind of a definition. What constitutes a person? An institution may, call, may be called a person with rights and duties. A fetus in the womb, some people say it is not a person yet. For some it is. That is where the discussion starts when they talk about uh, abortion. Many of us uh, <laughs> misuse the word abortion to mean miscarriage. Miscarriage is different from abortion. Abortion is artificially initiated, whereas miscarriage is natural. So, this uh, some certain communities in America oppose abortion. When they say the fetus inside has a right to exist. And some people say no, only when it is born it is a person. And ultimately the lawgiver will decide what the court will is, is going to decide, not our common man's understanding of person. A person in our common understanding is vyakti, but in law even institution is a person, a university is a person. Ordinary language use stays within the limits and constraints of language being used. It is tied down to the language, whereas a technical language is tied down to the definitions given for the subject, not what common man uses. This point comes uh, becomes important when it comes to translation. Ordinary language may not be that easily translated as a scientific text, because scientific texts are translatable because 
all the terms are definable what is definable is learnable is teachable is translatable ordinary language we have already seen it tolerates redundancy we said there is an expression called tautology that is same thing is repeated that is my uncle is a man my aunt is a woman that is tautology but in certain contexts this may be permitted for a reason how come your uncle can do this your aunt cannot do this well because my uncle is a man oh i see ah yes 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 correct that means men are allowed to do certain things women are not allowed to do okay 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 in ordinary language it is context dependent more the context will give you the total message whereas a scientific term if there is a term called osmosis osmosis is defined in botany and it will be the same definition whether it is a plant in america a plant in england a plant in europe plant in india and you say why did you say england and europe well in england generally very peculiar when they use the word continent they mean rest of europe they refer to themselves as a separate country so they refer to the continent means that that's how i use that term so that is the context in which i use otherwise england is part of europe but in legal document where i am talking about european economic community i won't say england and europe i will not i'll say england as part of europe that is where the uh, technicality will bring in so this context dependence will be absent at least is supposed to be absent in technical language though later i will bring in a term called unmeaning expression where to some extent where to some extent to take care of people who try to cheat this context does come in i'll come to that a little later before we go to the bolts and nuts of legal language per se let us go to the other extreme talk about poetic language so far we talked about ordinary language you may say why are you doing all this i told you pragmatics i am trying to locate legal language in the context of different types of language poetic language or stylized language systematic cultivation of dependence on language poetry systematically cultivates what they say kavi samayam or kavi hrudayam using language in a particular way poetry uses that way then systematic cultivation of independence of language is prose you may say what is this prose allows slight freedom from the sound effects of the language as such whereas poetry in its verse form assonance consonance alliteration and all that the language used becomes crucial that is why prose is a little more easily translatable than poetry poetry excludes translation without loss of meaning whereas prose to a large extent can be translated poetry cannot be cannot have translation without loss of meaning possibilities of multiple interpretations is very common in poetry and also in poetic prose where in our sanskrit rhetorics we use the word slesha multiple meaning later you may say no 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 sir we also know how high court judgment is nullified by supreme court because the interpretation is different but that kind of interpretation comes from not ambiguity not slesha but bringing in new facts to bear on the facts and new facts to bear on the case i mean i got no so many times i have quoted this uh, delhi high court judgment the difference between fabricant uh, government 
garment is made, there is cutting and stitching involved, in fabric it is not involved. So, ultimately a sari was declared to be fabric, but not garment. So, tax patterns differ, but not change of meaning of fabric, change of meaning of uh, garment. Many people who talk a little loosely against law make wrong comments. Please, for heaven's sake, do not do it, because democracy is governed by the maxim of rule of law. If we do not respect law, there will be no democracy at all. Ah, we say new facts, new constituents of a given term, all these things will matter. For example, language at one time was taken to be only communication system. Now, as science progresses, now they say language is the vehicle for culture. So, law will take note of both the points. That means, when we talk about the language and uh, let us say uh, uh, a government has applied to state government has applied to government of India for funds, uh, because their language has been uh, declared as classical language. Then some under secretary says, no, 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 you are now spending money on culture. You cannot spend money on culture, you should spend money only on grammar, semantics, phonology. Then this fellow, the, the, the intelligent fellow from the state says, sorry sir, language also means vehicle of culture, it is a vehicle for culture. Oh, how? Then he brings in new ideas from linguistics and the court will say yes, this seems to be all right, because language is not specially defined in a particular act. They will certainly take the opinion of experts, that is where linguists do come to court to give evidence on the subject. We have seen the, use, the way ordinary language is used and how the poetic language differs from it. In this episode, we have given a very brief introduction to semiotics and we also brought in the concept of semiotics of language and legal language. And we concentrated on the way ordinary language is used, poetic language is used and their values and then we brought in the concept of technical language. And in the next episode, we will discuss technical language in detail with special reference to legal language. Thank you.